So I want to speak a message to you today that I've entitled 24, the sequel. 24, the sequel. Acts chapter 24, verse 24 is where we're going to start today. So if I could have you open your Bibles to Acts chapter 24, verse 24. In the scriptures, they read this way. A few days later, Felix came back with his wife, Drusilla, who was Jewish, sending for Paul. They listened as he told them about faith in Christ Jesus, as he reasoned with them about righteousness and self-control in the coming day of judgment. Felix became frightened. Go away for now, he replied. When it's more convenient, I'll call for you again. Last week, we spoke about defending ourselves against Satan. We spoke about defending ourselves against his demons. And, and we spoke a lot about the spiritual realm. And, and what we said last week was, if we want to defend ourselves and put up a proper defense against the enemy, we had to confess. It was, we needed to confess Jesus Christ is Lord of all. We had to confess with our mouth and believe in our hearts and begin to put up this defense. Second thing we said was that we must put our hope in the second coming of Jesus Christ. See, it's this hope in the second coming of the Lord that is unmovable. It's unshakable. It's unbreakable. No matter what happens in our life, we put our hope in the second coming of Jesus, and the enemy can't penetrate that. And also, we spoke about how it's important to live a life with a clear conscience before God and before man. We don't give the devil an opportunity to attack. We don't give him that opportunity to get into our lives and destroy us. But this week, we're going to pick up where we left off. But this week, we're going to talk about how to properly defend ourselves and how to properly defend the gospel, but on a little bit more of a physical realm. In the world around us, how do we defend the gospel See, I spoke last week about this TV show called 24. And the basic concept of this show is you have the terrorists and the terrorist organization, and they're trying to do evil things. You have the good guys or the counter-terrorist organization, and they're trying to stop this evil from spreading. They're, they're trying to defend the country, trying to defend the nation and defend the world. But the problem is, is on this show, every time... There is always this resistance. There's always this resistance from the good guy being able to easily stop the bad guy. And the truth is, is that the church is sent with a mission. The mission is quite simple. Spread the gospel of Jesus Christ. Tell the world about the loving Savior, Jesus Christ, that all men might be saved. But the truth is, is we're constantly facing resistance. Anyone who's watched the news recently knows the gospel message is facing resistance. In fact, there's an organization in North America right now that what they do is they go into a small community and they erect a, a satanic altar or a satanic monument. And when the community starts to complain about this, they reply with a simple message. We will take down our satanic monument if you take down your religious symbols. You'll take down anything that represents Christianity. Well, this organization is backed by hundreds of millions of dollars of funding. These little communities, they can't go to battle in court. They can't fight this out. They don't have the money. So the result is, is that they concede defeat and they say, fine, if you'll take down your satanic symbols, then we will take down our Christian symbols. And the result is, is that more and more across North America, we're seeing Jesus Christ pushed out of society. More and more, we're seeing this hostile resistance to the gospel. So the question arises, how do we defend the Christian message? How do we defend the gospel message with so much hostility around us? Well, in Acts 24, Paul comes to Jerusalem He's going to meet the church. He's going to give them some money, and he wants to go to the temple. But like we learned last week, there was a plot that came forward. The Jews were going to kill Paul. 
pretty evil plot. But Paul decides that he's going to go anyway to the temple. And he goes and they arrest him. Now they brought two charges against Paul. One, they accused him of bringing a Gentile into the temple courts. This was punishable, punishable by death according to the Jewish law. But there was a second thing they, they accused him of. And that's causing a disruption or disorder. Some say a riot. Now, according to Roman law, if you were found causing a disturbance, if you were found causing a riot, this receives severe punishment, severe public punishment. See, the Romans, they would either crucify you or they would whip you and lash you in public. They did this so that everybody else in the city would see what happens when you oppose Roman rule. It was done publicly to put fear into the hearts of people. So now, you think of Paul. And Paul's standing here, and on one side, he has the Romans, who they just want to stop a riot from happening, and they're willing to use force. On the other side, you have the Jews. They just want to make sure that the temple is kept sacred, and the gospel isn't spread, and they're willing to use force. So on both sides of Paul, we see two forces surrounding him who are willing to use force, you are willing to use hostility to stop him at all costs. And as we study through this today, what we're going to see is how Paul responded to this. How Paul responded when hostility was all around him and how he defended the gospel message. So first and foremost, to defend the gospel message, we must understand that not everybody believes in Jesus Christ. Seems like a pretty simple concept, but as you're going to learn, it doesn't so come so easy for us sometimes. Not everyone believes in Jesus. Acts 24 verse 24 says that a few days later, Felix came back with his wife, Drusilla. Now the Bible doesn't tell us much about Drusilla. It just tells us that she was a Jew and that she was the wife of Felix. But when we look at the ancient historian Josephus and we look at some other historians, they begin to draw a bit more of a picture of who Drusilla really was. Drusilla, when she was 14 years old, was engaged to be married to a prince. That's a pretty good start to life, 14 years old. You got life all ahead of you. But as she was engaged to be married to the prince, she ran off with the king. As you can imagine, this was quite a stir. This was quite scandalous in the empire. And if that wasn't bad enough, when she was married to the king... She ran off with Felix. So this woman didn't have much of a reputation. Not a good one anyway. And the truth is, is that was this huge scandal throughout the entire empire. This was the talk of the town, if you will. Now Felix, Felix was very cruel. In fact, Felix, whenever there was a disturbance in a, in a city, Felix would send assassins out into the crowd and he would kill anyone who was supporting this disturbance. And because he was so cruel, because he was using such force and such hostility, there was groups and factions and rebellions that would rise up against him. One of these rebellions we know very well was the great Jewish revolt, which led to the destruction of Jerusalem and the destruction of the temple. So see, he was not only cruel, but when we look to verse 26, we actually read that he was trying to get a bribe from Paul. So we see this corrupt nature of Felix. So, you, so we see that Drusilla and Felix, they were not a very good couple. Now why is this important? It's important because we must understand that Paul was not standing in front of loving, respectable, nice people when he began to share the gospel. He was standing in front of cruel, corrupt immoral people who wanted really nothing to do with the gospel message. It's important to understand this because not everyone we speak to is going to be receptive to the gospel. In fact, 2 Timothy 3, starting at verse 1 says, You should know this, Timothy, that in the last days there will be very difficult times, for people will love only themselves and their money. They will be boastful and proud, scoffing at God, disobedient to their parents and ungrateful. They will consider nothing sacred. 
they will be unloving and unforgiving. They will slander others and have no self-control. They will be cruel and they will hate what is good. They will betray their friends. They will be reckless. They will be puffed up with pride. They will love pleasure rather than God. And they will act religious. But they will reject the power that could make them godly. Stay away from people like that. See, there are those who will gain information about Christianity. They will seek to be informed about Christianity. But in reality, there are those who are seeking this information so that they can fight with Christians, so that they can discredit Christianity. It's important to understand this because the Bible never taught us to go out into the streets and fight with people. The scriptures teach us to be witnesses for Jesus Christ. And this does not include going out and losing self-control and ruining our witness and ruining our ability to ever minister or ever share the gospel with them or those around them ever again. See, we've all seen on Facebook, oh, how we love Facebook, but we've all seen on Facebook where someone will share a, a verse or they'll share a quote or they'll share this Christian thought of the day. And we've all seen where in the comment section someone will reply pretty hostile against Christianity. And they say all sorts of things. But it's unfortunate that what we see many times is a retaliation from the so-called Christian. We'll see this retaliation where things are being said and things are being done that is absolutely disgracing the gospel message and is destroying the witness See, it's important to understand that there are those who do not believe in Jesus before we ever talk to them. It's important because this is the truth of it. Attitude is everything when we're defending the gospel. I want you to say that with me. Attitude is everything. Again, attitude is everything when we're defending the gospel message. People watch us. People watch us. Attitude is everything. But to defend the gospel message, we must also remember that Jesus Christ must be. This is not an option. Jesus Christ must be the cornerstone of our defense. Acts 24, 24 says that a few days later, Felix and Drusilla, his wife, or days later, Felix came back with Drusilla, his wife, who was Jewish, sending for Paul, they listened as he told them about faith in Jesus Christ. So here comes Paul, and he's going to stand before Drusilla and stand before Felix, who we've just met, and that we know they're not very Christian people. And the Bible says that he spoke to them about Christ Jesus. In other words, Jesus Christ was the focal point of this conversation that Paul was having with, with this couple. Now let's say that you're going to go out and mow the lawn one day. And so you go out to mow the lawn and your spouse decides that they're going to come out and weed while you mow. They're going to help you. How loving. Not only that, but it's a hot day and so they decide that they're going to go in and they're going to get you some ice water. Even more loving, right? So they go in and they're doing this great deed for you and they've, they've left their gloves and their sandals out where they were, where they were uh, weeding for you and, and you go by on your lawnmower and you run right over top of their gloves and their sandals, destroying them. So they come outside and, and they look and they see their brand new sandals and their brand new gloves spread all over the lawn. They look at you and they say, what in the world did you do? You just ran over my brand new sandals and gloves. Now, tell me if this sounds familiar, because this is how many people reply. Well, why did you leave the gloves there? It's your fault. I mean, it's, you're always leaving stuff around. You're always leaving stuff. Besides, it's not like you never make mistakes. You burned supper last night, right? In the mental health field, there's a word for this. It's called deflecting. What deflecting is, is when you maneuver to deflect the attention of the people from what's really happening. So the truth is, is you should have been paying attention. 
It's your fault you ran over the gloves and the sandals. It's your fault. But what you've done is you've tried to take the focus and take that negative influence or that negative consequence away from you and you've placed it on somebody else. So what you've done is you've deflected. And the truth is, is that when we begin to tell people about Jesus Christ, this happens quite often. See, in the mental health field, deflecting, which we all do, is a very unhealthy coping mechanism. Very unhealthy. But we see this all the time when we try to share the gospel. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 14 says, Either way, Christ's love controls us. Since we believe that Christ died for all, we also believe that we have all died to our old life. He died for everyone so that those who receive this new life will no longer live for themselves. Instead, they will live for Christ who died and was raised for them. Paul told the Corinthian church, when you give your heart to Jesus Christ, when you give your heart and commit your life to him, it's no longer you who lives. It's Christ in you. In other words, this isn't my life anymore. This is Jesus Christ. When you have made the commitment, it is no longer your life to live. It is Jesus Christ. This is what he's saying. Jesus Christ is the focal point of our life. If Jesus Christ is the focal point of our life, then this stands to reason that Jesus Christ is the focal point of our faith. If Jesus Christ is the focal point of our faith, then Jesus Christ most obviously must be the focal point of the gospel message. If Jesus Christ is the focal point of the gospel message, which he most certainly is, then it stands to reason he must be the focal point of our defense of the gospel. See, many times when Christians are trying to defend the faith against someone who does not believe in the gospel, the conversation will go to creation. The conversation will go to what the Bible defines as sin. It will go to the the old Jewish laws. It will go to everything else except Jesus Christ. But really what's happening here is they are deflecting. Because the fact of the matter is, is that when the reality that Jesus Christ existed, he was a real man, when that hits them, when the reality that Jesus Christ did indeed perform miracles, he did indeed raise from the dead, he did indeed come and is the son of the most high God, suddenly they're faced with a reality. Suddenly they are faced that If Jesus is real, then suddenly you're faced with the reality that you were born in sin and there is a need for a Savior. Suddenly you're faced with the reality that there is a God that created. Suddenly you are faced with the reality that there is a life of holiness that we are to live. See, you must understand a very, very important principle here. You can convince somebody that creation is real. You can convince them, but that's not going to save them. You can convince them and you can teach them about the laws of Moses. You can teach them the difference between the old and the new covenant. You can teach them all about the laws of Moses, but that's not going to save them. You can teach them and you can convince them to turn their life from sin and they can live a life free of sin. They can live their life as best as they can. But that's not going to save them. There's one thing that can save them. There is one thing that the Bible says will save our soul and that is putting our faith in Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone. See, there's an important thing to understand here. It is never about winning an argument. It's about winning a soul. Say that with me. It's never about winning an argument. It's about winning a soul. This is the purpose. 
This is why we defend the gospel. This is why we share the gospel, is to win souls. And so anything that we do, anything that we say, anything at all, anything that hinders the winning of a soul is not right. Simply not right. See, when defending the gospel message, we've got to remember that not everyone believes in Jesus Christ. We must not become offended with people when they don't believe what we believe. We can't do it. We can't do it. It's not about winning the argument. It's about winning the soul. If there's nothing else you take home from that today, Remember those words. Remember those words. But there's still one more important thing about defending the gospel. And it's that we must warn people. We must warn people. In Acts 24, verse 25, it says, As he reasoned with them about righteousness and self-control in the coming day of judgment, Felix became frightened. Go away for now, he replied. When it's more convenient, I'll call for you again. So we spoke earlier about the kind of life that Felix and Drusilla had been living. They weren't exactly the model Christian couple by any means. So here comes Paul. We know that there's this scandal throughout the empire. And and here comes Paul to talk to them about Jesus. Now, it's human nature. when, When you go to talk to somebody and there's something that's glaringly obvious that there's this huge elephant in the room, it tends to be human nature to avoid it. If you go and talk to a woman and she has this big pimple on her face that she's tried to cover up with makeup, you don't look at her and go, my land is hideous. It's huge. It's grotesque. Right? You don't draw attention to it. You kind of draw away from that conversation when you know it's going to cause a bit of upheaval, let's say. But Paul, he shows up knowing that there's this scandal, knowing that they live this cruel, adulterous life. And Paul talks to them about self-control. He talks to them about righteousness. And he talks to them about the judgment to come. Paul pointed out the elephant in the room. Paul pointed out the elephant in the room. Now, I'll be the first person to admit that there are a lot of Christians who find it really, really easy to point out sin. They find it really easy to point out sin in everybody's life. They find it really easy to point out all the sin in the community. They find it really easy to point out all the sin in the country. And it it just becomes so natural to them. But you want to know something? How people look at those people? When we begin to point out all the sin in people's lives... They look at us as self-righteous hypocrites. That's hard to hear, but that's what the world sees us. When we stand and that's all we do is point out everyone's sin, point it out and point it out, they see us as self-righteous hypocrites. But see, Paul stands in front of Drusilla and Felix, and he pointed out their sin. He pointed out the need for righteousness, the need for self-control. But Paul did something very important. He pointed out the why. He pointed out why that was important. Why they needed to move from the sin. Why they needed self-righteousness. Why or righteousness. Why they needed self-control. Revelation 20 verse 11 starts off and it says, And I saw a great white throne and the one sitting on it. The earth and the sky fled from his presence, but they found no place to hide. I saw the dead, both great and small, standing before God's throne. And the books were open, including the book of life. And the dead were were judged according to what they had done, as recorded in the books. The sea gave up the dead, and the death and grave gave up their dead. And all were judged according to their deeds. Then death and the grave were thrown into the lake of fire. This lake of fire is the second death. Hear this. And anyone whose name was not recorded in the book of life was thrown into the lake of fire. See, the why 
answering the why question. That takes the conversation from being self-righteous hypocrites to pleading for their soul. The why question is all important. See, the Bible teaches that there's going to come a day when every last person who has ever been on this earth, present and past, are going to stand before the Lord on judgment day, and we are going to be judged. That means it doesn't matter how rich or poor you are. It doesn't matter the color of your skin. It doesn't matter your gender. It doesn't matter if you believe that God exists or not. None of that matters. What matters is is that you are going to stand before God. There is no way to escape that. We're going to stand and hold account for what we've done. And you know what? It doesn't matter how many good things you did on this earth. It doesn't matter how nice of a person you were. There's one thing that matters on that day. The Bible says that if your name is found in the Lamb's book of life, then you are spared. And if your name is not found in the Lamb's book of life, there's eternal judgment. And the Bible clearly states there is only one way to have your name found in that book, and that's by putting your faith in Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone. I'm going to conclude here. The Bible tells us, the Bible tells us clearly that this is truth, that your name has got to be written in that book of life. And this is why it is so important to explain to people this, because when we stick to just telling people about their sin, when it's, it's fine for us just to simply tell people that the way they're living is sick and immoral and all we're doing is causing more of a gap, more of a chasm. They're looking at us more and more as self-righteous hypocrites. But when we turn that into a loving plea for their soul, when we explain to them, man, there is a judgment that's coming. And if you're found not to be in that book, hear me when I say that it's over at that point. The knowledge that you have, it's not going to matter at that point. You may believe that Jesus existed and you may be thinking, I'll wait. I'll wait until a better time. I'll wait till life calms down. I'll I'll wait until maybe these these feelings go away. I'll, I'll maybe I'll wait until the temptation's gone. It might be too late. It might be too late. Because the day that that book is opened and your name is not found in that book, all the crying in the world, all of the begging in the world, it won't matter. Church, we're fighting for the souls of mankind. We're fighting for their souls. We as Christians are called to defend the gospel message. We're called to share that message. We must remember that not everyone we talk to is saved and not everyone's going to believe it. We must not become offended when they lash out. We must not become offended when they degrade us. We must not become defended because our attitude is everything when we're sharing the gospel. But as well, we've got to keep Jesus Christ at the focus. He must be the center of the message because it is not about winning an argument with them. It's about winning their soul. You can win the argument and lose the soul. I'm telling you right now, it's not worth it. You haven't pleased the Lord, I'll tell you that. But as well, we must warn them. 
and of a heart of compassion and that a heart of love, we must warn them. I want everyone just to look here for one second. We're running out of time. If you believe in the Bible, which I believe every last one of us do, that are here today, if you believe in the Bible and you believe in prophecy, we're out of time. We are out of time. So this is going to sound blunt and forward, but if you love your family, do what it takes. If you think it's going to be offensive to tell them that they've got to turn away from what they're doing and they've got to serve the living God because time is running out, then so be it. But it is worth having them angry at you for getting that gospel message to them and having their souls saved. If you've got friends who you love, you truly love them, don't wait any longer. Now's the time. We're out of time. We've got to share the message with them. We've got to share the gospel. Time is up. Jesus is returning. If I could have everyone stand. If I could have every head bowed and every eye closed. If you're hearing this today, whether you are at home or whether you're here and you are not living a life that is committed to Jesus Christ and you know it. And right now, even if you doubt that if that book was open today that your name would not be found in it. But you want to make a change. And you want to say, I want my name written in the Lamb's book of life. And I want salvation. And I'm not willing to take a chance. If that's you, raise a hand where you're at today and say, that's me. Jesus, I've shared today your word. Jesus, I've shared what you've placed on my heart. And Lord, it's up to you now. Scripture says that Paul watered, Apollos planted, and it's you who gave the increase. So Jesus, I've planted, done a little bit of watering. Oh, but Lord, it's up to you to give the increase. So Jesus, I pray that you would give the increase. I pray, Lord, that your kingdom would be further today from this message. I pray, Lord, as it goes out on the internet, that Jesus, that you would use this message and you would lead people to a loving relationship with you. Show them salvation, oh God. God, we pray for the salvation of souls, both here and abroad. Lord, give us courage. For those who did not raise their hand, who said, no, I'm, I'm right with the Lord. Lord, give us courage. Give us courage to preach this message. Give us courage to defend the gospel. Give us courage to step out in faith. Give us courage to share the love of Jesus Christ with others. Jesus, we thank you. In your name we pray.